teammates. Welcome to The Well, the Live Well podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Jen Collings. And I'm Seth Christopher. Welcome to The Well. Good morning, Seth. How's it going? Hey, Jen. Doing well. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing fabulous as usual. Excited to be here to talk about our topic today. I am also really excited to talk about today's topic. We're combining a couple of themes from Live Well. One, it's still the month of November, so we're still talking about diabetes and diabetes awareness. And then two, it's still the month of November, so we're going to be talking about nutrition because it's probably top of mind for a lot of people's um, process over the next four to six weeks. Great point. And we are going to talk about nutrition. We have a guest on our show today from the one of the diabetes with atrium, diabetes educators with atrium health. So I'm very excited to have her on. So let's get into it. Let's do it. You ready to get started with some fast facts? Lay them on me. All right. Fast fact. When it comes to dieting and diabetes, one size does not fit all. According to a consensus report from 2019, that mindset may simplify the messaging around eating, but a one size fits all eating plan is not supported by evidence. There's just too much variability around the broad spectrum of individuals affected by diabetes and prediabetes. This can include cultural backgrounds, eating preferences, socioeconomic settings, and of course the presence of other disease states. Fast fact, social support can go a long way. And a study of more than 75,000 people with diabetes, individuals who receive group diabetes education versus those who received individual counseling were less likely to have extreme events like ending up in the hospital or ER for severely low or high blood sugar. They were also more likely to be more compliant on screenings and medications. Those are some great facts. Um, I want to go back to the first fact that you talked about the one size does not fit all. So just to broaden that out, that's such a great, great advice that we can give. And we're talking about diabetes and nutrition, but really what's great about what we're going to talk about is anybody can take these tips that we're going to discuss and put them into their own their own habits. Yes, I, we're going to have some great feedback from our a great conversation with our guests today. But yes, Jen, there's some just some core tenets about nutrition that can guide all of us regardless of disease state and you know, we have to consider the variability that goes across each of us, you know, those preferences, our backgrounds, you know, what's available uh, versus, you know, what's our current state. And so staying connected to either your registered dietitian, your primary care provider, your provider um, in some way, shape, form or fashion as you start to make these changes and understand where your body's at physiologically can make a huge impact on your overall quality of life. Absolutely. Great facts to get us kicked off with. I'm going to move into our next section. You ready to do some myth busting? Let's bust some myths. Awesome. Myth number one, if you have diabetes, you should stop eating starchy foods such as bread, potatoes, and pasta. Here's the fact. Starchy foods are not the enemy. They can be part of a healthy nutrition plan as long as we take those portion sizes into account. So starchy foods such as whole grain breads, rice, cereal, pasta, those starchy vegetables um, that we see this time of year, potatoes, yams, peas, and corn, they can absolutely make a healthy addition to meals or to snacks. You just got to make sure you count your carbs as you go through your daily tracking. Myth number two, kind of along the same lines, carbohydrates are the enemy. We hear this so much, don't we? Here's the fact. Carbs are not, in, are not the enemy in any way. The type of carb and the quantity is most important when healthy eating with diabetes. Not all carbs are cre created equal. You have to look at the glycemic index of each. So your carbohydrate foods with a lower glycemic index are going to be better than those with a higher glycemic index. And I know what you're wondering. What in the heck did I just say? What does that mean? So I've got to be honest with you, Jen. I was I was ready to ask the same question for our teammates. You <laughs> said glycemic. You said GI. And so help help me understand a little bit more. All right. So it's just some examples of a low glycemic index foods. The ones that we would recommend that people eat would be rolled or steel cut oatmeal, whole grain breads, 
dry beans and legumes, or low starch vegetables such as spinach, broccoli, and tomatoes. So, so those low GI foods are going to be provide more nutrients like fiber and vitamins, and your higher glycemic index foods are going to be things like simple sugars and processed foods. So those are the things we want to try to stay away from. Got it. I think that's a little bit easier to look at. Awesome. All right. Myth number three, you'll never eat dessert again. This one's so sad, but the fact is, yes, you absolutely can eat dessert. Sound the wanted... drums. That's right, especially this time of year with pumpkin pies and apple pies and pecan pies. I'm going to get hungry. Um, moderation is the key when we're talking about things like desserts and, and holiday meals, and then also tracking your nutrition, which Jennifer will talk about a little bit more later. These are key components of a healthy nutrition plan. As you're keeping your food journal or using a tracking app, this can help stay in control of your choices. It's okay to indulge. I want to say that again. It is okay to indulge. Just remember to balance. Our last myth, while on medication, you, I can eat whatever I want. So the fact is that medication is a tool to help with glucose control and is not a free license to eat whatever it is that you want. The key to staying healthy is to taking the medication as prescribed and then following a healthy diet and exercise plan like we talked about last time. Regularly eating unhealthy foods or increased portions may prohibit your medication from doing the job it is meant to do. So it works well with the nutrition and exercise changes. Interesting that you noted throughout these myths, Jen. It sounds like there's a lot of thought around, and I know being around and having family members who are diabetic or pre-diabetic, there's just this huge consideration about having to change and really stop eating a lot of the foods that you love. And what it seems like, it's not necessarily that we have to stop, but we have to understand that it's part of a bigger picture. So that Monday morning meal impacts and should be tracked throughout the week and is, is really just a just a small piece of the entire puzzle that you know we're trying to piece together as we start to put together these good habits and understand you know what we what we can do better versus what things we should probably limit and it sounds like going after those um, those low gi foods like the the oatmeal and the whole grain uh, bread beans legumes some of those other vegetables is, is a way to start and pushing those into your diet as as much as you can Absolutely. And Jennifer's going to bring us some really great recommendations and talk to us a lot about how to put these changes into a lifestyle. But that's what it's all about. Down balance, moderation, and finding a way to enjoy food in a healthy way for your body. And then just making sure teammates, quick caveat, you know, we're, we're providing a high level information and advice, but always, always make sure that you're consulting with your provider and getting the right plan of action put forth for you. Um, again, this is all high level information, basic tenets of, of, of good habits, considering where you are. Just make sure you're, you're engaging with the professionals um, that can give you a little bit more specific information if you have those individual needs. Well said, Seth. And on that note, Let's bring on our professional, our licensed professional. Let's do it. Today we have Jennifer Rawlings with us. She is a registered dietitian and diabetes care and education specialist. She works at the Diabetes and Nutrition Care Center at Atrium Health Union. She graduated from Western Carolina University and then completed her master's at Winthrop University. She lives in Charlotte with her husband and two daughters. Jennifer, welcome to the well. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here today. Jennifer, we're really excited to have you here to talk about a very sophisticated, complicated problem of diabetes. You know, Jen, Jen and I have spent some time talking about just how individualized it is. Um, you being on the front lines all the time and having such a, a core focus in diabetes care, I'm, I'm sure that you can agree. So we're glad to have you here just to, to walk us through and talk through the how we can we can help to provide some solutions for our teammates. Sure, yes, I've been with Atrium for 10, almost 15 years. Bounced back and forth from a couple of facilities, um, but really have been specialized in diabetes for the last 10 years. So um, it has definitely changed more than we've ever seen. So it's been exciting to be a part of this um, with all the technology that's out there. But at Atrium, um, we do counsel a lot of teammates. Um, we see kids with diabetes, we see adults, elderly patients with diabetes. So it is 
all in our community and all over other communities as well. Um, we'd really just help patients focus um, on the basics, usually at first. So um, how to be healthy, how to actually prevent diabetes if they were told they had prediabetes. Um, and so we can get into a lot of that today, um, just looking at what are some of the basics that people can do um, to establish some healthy habits. Um, we really just dive into the meal plan. I don't like to use the word diet. I prefer a meal plan um, because we're always hopefully planning and preparing um, and looking forward to what we can change um, with small changes that can really add up. So um, with that, I'll just kind of go into some guidelines that we start people off with is just looking at your day and seeing um, often you're eating, how often you're fueling your body, um, how often um, you know, you're feeding your body healthy foods versus unhealthy foods. Um, one of the biggest things that I see is people aren't feeding their bodies the right nutrition or enough of the right nutrition. Um, and so that can mean one big meal a day or you know, six little meals a day. People are all doing different things. Um, one of the best things to do is really eat consistent. So every three to four to five hours, try to fuel your body. So it prevents you from overeating, um, prevents you from getting too hungry, um, and it's also great for blood sugar control. So one of the best things that you can do is have that consistent amount um, of what we really focus on is the carbohydrates um, in the diet to control the blood sugars. Jennifer, that's so interesting that you bring up that point, just being consistent. And you also talked about a couple of points, just a variety of diet information that's out there, the fad diets. It sounds like you have put together a pretty easy to follow solution for that and is the way you, you kind of approach this and you know, just finding some of the core basics and creating some consistency of the right stuff. Right. And I always suggest people start with one small area. It can really feel overwhelming if you're meeting with someone, your doctor or a dietitian or educator and you feel like you're doing all the wrong things. So we really start in one area, pick one meal, one time a day that's most challenging. So when you really see some good positive changes in there, you're more likely to be able to continue to make other changes in areas that may be a little bit easier. So we will start with breakfast or lunch or dinner or wherever you may eat out the most. We try to um, reduce the amount of eating out um, or skipping the meal. So we'll definitely recommend starting with one small change can make um, big improvements. So that's an that's a great our point to make. And the one thing that comes to mind is it's not like flipping a switch, right? So it has, this is when people put in different eating plans and are, are working on making their nutrition a little bit better, it's going to take some time. They can't go from on Sunday, we're eating anything we want to Monday. Now we have perfect nutrition. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Right. So try not to think of it as you know, during the week and then the weekend is separate, trying to think of every day you wake up is a new chance to make healthy changes. And if you fall off the track with a meal um, around the holidays or birthday, just get right back on track. So don't look at look at it as, you know, the week versus the weekend, because that can really blow it for a lot of people if their weekends are way off track compared to during the week. I love that approach, Jennifer. We often talk about here on the show, do a little bit more or do a little bit better today than you did yesterday and just try to get those small personal wins <clears throat> to help create that consistency in the process. So I love hearing that that's a very similar approach and, and almost it sounds like a foundation of how you would approach coaching and, and providing education around you know, making a change to either re reduce risk or reduce some of the complications that might accompany being diagnosed with, as a diabetic. Right. And there's so many ways to do that. Research really shows by keeping a personal personal journal. So a food log, a food diary, whether it's handwritten. Um, there's a lot of apps that are out there now. My fitness pal is a great one. A lot of my patients use um, to just log what you eat and it can break down all the ingredients and nutrients for you. But overall, Research shows if you just log it, you will start making little changes because you don't want to have to log those things that you know um, are not healthy for you. So if you're eating six cookies and you're logging that every day, you will start to slowly dwindle down maybe to one or two without even thinking about it. Keeping a food journal becomes very visual very quickly, that is for sure. 
Right. And it just really helps you see what's going on before you meet with anybody to look at that and give you feedback. So these are great tips. Sounds like for everyone, honestly, not even if you have diabetes or don't have diabetes. For our teammates who are, you know, have been diagnosed with prediabetes or diabetes, are there some specific things that they need to, that they could look at at making changes in their diet? Yes, um, so many things. Um, the biggest thing with diabetes and even prediabetes is your body is really resistant to insulin. So um, definitely ways to reduce your insulin resistance. Um, I know you guys talked about exercise on the last podcast and I always say movement is medicine. So that is one piece. But as far as food to help your body with insulin resistance um, is again eating really good amounts of carbohydrates uh, throughout the day. So if you have one meal with no carbs and then at dinner you try to eat all your carbs for the day, your body's resistant to your insulin. Um, or that insulin resistance is going to be still in full effect. So it's a lot better to feed your body smaller portions of the carbs more consistently, but the choice of the carbohydrate is most important. So if it's not what I call packaged with fiber, um, then it's a simple carbohydrate. It's digested quickly, um, the blood sugar spikes quickly, and usually we hear of that kind of crash afterwards. So if it's packed with fiber, it does great for your body's insulin resistance and blood sugar control. So carbs are not the enemy here. That's what that's what I'm hearing. Exactly. Yes. Yes. They are not the enemy. When we look at carbs, three main food groups are carbs. So if we eliminate all those, we're very limited and we can become deficient in certain nutrients. So starches, fruits, and milk and yogurt are your main sources of carbohydrates. So we can't eliminate all of those from the body. There's a lot of healthy choices within those groups. Jennifer, I love the term packed with fiber. I'm actually going to find a way to use that in a, in a podcast in the future just because I think it's it's a very powerful. Um, <clears throat> but in all seriousness, what what are some what are some of those ideal foods of somewhat carb heavy or carb laden but are, are packed with fiber? What are some things that I could go to the store and pick up and put in my shopping cart and feel good that I'm making a, a, a solid choice? Yes, I think we all have heard brown rice versus white rice, you know, brown pasta versus white pasta, wheat bread versus white bread. But to give a little bit more detail, there's a lot of great new products on the market. One of my new favorites is the pastas that are made from chickpea or lentil. Um, and it says it on the front of the box. They are actually packed with more fiber than whole wheat pasta. And a lot of people don't like whole wheat pasta because of its grainy, dense texture. So these new pastas have even more fiber, but the texture of white pastas. Um, so that's a great option um, if you like pastas, but sweet potatoes, beans like pinto beans, black beans, kidney beans, making chili with those things uh, this time of year is very healthy because of all the beans that are packed with fiber. Um, the skin on fruits and vegetables, so the skin on a baked potato, the skin on the apple, eating the whole food if you can, um, those things are gonna be packed with a lot of fiber. And we also think about so the carbohydrates. There's a lot of variability in diets and what, what we hear and read about every day. I mean, there's keto, there's low carb, there's high carb, there's anywhere in between. If I'm at, if I'm pre-diabetic or if I'm diabetic, those, you know, some of those changes, those drastic changes can have a pretty big impact. Um, so I guess what I'm thinking about is just the balance of it all. Um, your proteins, fats, we also we can't forget about those too, right? What, what are some other good suggestions that maybe we can do to incorporate a more um, whole diet? Yes, there are a lot of those diets out there and a lot of them um, are very low carb, which patients be a good benefit from the beginning. But typically long-term, if we're eating higher fat diets like the keto diet, um, it can actually worsen insulin resistance over time. So your body will eventually become more resistant to um, that form of diet, not to mention cholesterol. So you're looking at um, really preventing high cholesterol um, in the long run with diabetes, but following a keto type diet, which is very high in fat, typically raises cholesterol levels. So for my patients, I caution them with those diets. I will work with them if they want to follow those to make sure they're choosing more of the healthier fats. Um, some great sources there are avocado, olive oil, they even make avocado oil now, which is great for cooking, um, nuts and seeds 
flax seeds, chia seeds, you can add into yogurt and smoothies, um, into your cereal, you can make muffins with them. So you can kind of hide those in a lot of foods to bulk up the good amount of fats. Um, a lot of those diets are filled with bacon and butter, um, cream cheese and mayonnaise, so more of the saturated unhealthy fats, which again, in the long run, is not good for insulin resistance and cholesterol. You named some pretty good foods there, Jennifer. I don't think that that's very restrictive, um, but I, lo I love the take home here is this that sometimes we can be focused too much on the short term and put ourselves at uh, inherent risk increases a little bit later on just by the, the way that we balance or don't balance our diet choices. Right. I think the long term is, is what I have patients really think about blood sugar control immediately, but long term, what's going to be the best healthy eating plan usually isn't categorized as one of those fad diets. And we know that heart disease and diabetes now go hand in hand. So it's important to, to maintain that balance, I would think, with you know not doing too many heavy fats and the, the unhealthy fats because you don't want one disease to make another disease worse. So. Yep, even with um, the carbohydrates that are low fiber typically can raise triglyceride levels. Having diabetes long term, you're more predisposed to high cholesterol and LDL levels. Um, and that change in the profile of the density of the cholesterol component is what increases patients' risk of heart disease, heart attack, stroke, um, is really the number one killer of patients with diabetes. So we really have to keep that um, into account long term. I imagine from your position, it's so hard. I mean, human behavior, there's just so many variabilities. It's so hard to get people to think big picture. So I'm going to ask you a question about short picture. We are kind of in the back end of the year, and we all know that that brings some extra eating around certain um, days for, that are remaining in the year. Any, any tips you can provide, you can share with your experience, um, ways that we can better manage our diets through Thanksgiving and the remaining holidays? Yes, the biggest biggest questions I get this time of year. Um, there are a lot of tips that you can follow to be healthy. And I love food, so I encourage people to enjoy those foods they love and maybe don't eat throughout the year or eat very often. But there are some small changes and just things that you can use to be more aware of what you're doing around the holidays. Um, one of the biggest things is dessert. My patients wonder what can they have, how much can they have, um, but yes, have dessert. Um, an example would be if you like pie, pumpkin pie is a lot lower calorie and fat than pecan pie. And even if you want to try to make it with Splenda um, to make it sugar free, it's even um, going to be a lot lower in sugar and better for your blood sugar. Um, but portion is important. So if you really are craving the pie with Thanksgiving, maybe you give up the dinner roll or maybe you give up one of the starchier sides and do more of the green beans or salad with the meal. So you can kind of make some swaps um, to determine what is it that's really worth it to you um, and then get moving. We all want to sit down and fall asleep after we eat a big meal, but within that next hour, get moving, go for a walk with your friends or your family, um, get that body processing that food, that insulin flowing against the insulin resistance. Um, and that can be just two great things to really try right there. Is there a food or recipe that you recommend to your your patients around this time of year that they have to either try something new or to make sure that they indulge in just out of curiosity? <laughs> um, I love a traditional Thanksgiving meal, which I think a lot of people do, which is a lot of starchy sides, mashed potatoes, sweet potato casserole, stuffing, um, and of course, all the desserts. So I just encourage a lot of my patients are interested this time of year because they're cooking more. So they're interested to try different recipes. So it might be that we really help them with dessert. You know, do they want to make a pie that's made with Splenda instead of sugar um, and not tell their family so they can get some feedback um, to see if they've noticed. Um, so a lot of it will usually be for the desserts, how to make those kind of lower calorie, lower sugar options, because those are really prevalent around the holiday season. But people, they love to do that and they love to report back to me. And most of the time they will say, not anybody said a word. They had no idea I did this or that or changed this. Well, do you have your patients um, track and keep a food journal during the holidays or do you give them a, a, a hiatus? 
during that time? What do you recommend? So just like blood sugars, I don't recommend they take a vacation the whole day. Um, if we're not writing down food, that's fine, but I definitely tell them to check their blood sugar because it's going to be a learning experience. Because if Thanksgiving is going to be multiple places, multiple events, or more than a day, or Christmas is coming up, they can learn for the next event. Um, so I think the blood sugar control and blood sugar check is most important. Um, if the food log helps keep them on track, I will encourage them to do that. But I know I normally just give them a pass when I look at the food journal for Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> and I love how you pointed out kind of changing things up. I know in my family, I mean, obviously this year is going to be much different for all of us, but typically in my family, I'm the one that's bringing the, the uber healthy or somewhat healthier meals. Um, and I usually end up taking those meals back home, which always benefits <laughs> me because if they weren't healthy ish, I would probably feel so much worse about myself when I get back and I'm like eating it all at once. Right. And, uh, but, uh, but that's all part of enjoying it and really taking advantage of just the experience of having having those opportunities. I was just going to say, it's a great time of year. Um, I just tell people to, to try to stay on track throughout the day is another important tip. If the meal is going to be late afternoon or evening, don't go all day and not eat anything. So again, you're looking at erratic blood sugar control, um, most likely to indulge at the meal more so than you would have if you had just a couple of small snacks throughout the day. Um, so really try not to starve yourself until that meal, um, but to eat it for a couple of days in small portions is a lot better um, than eating very large portions of it at one time. What I have loved about this conversation more than anything is you have said so many times, eat this, eat this, eat this. That's such a great positive message that our teammates can be healthy, enjoy eating, and not feel like they're they're going without. Yes, there are so many disordered eating patterns um, with food um, that may not be classified as a diagnosis per se, but there is so much negativity there when patients either leave their doctor and they feel defeated or they come to me and they're scared to come to me because they think I'm going to take away everything. But I've always thought after what can we change to make it better? What can we add in that's healthier? Because if you do that, focus on what you need to be adding in and need to be doing, a lot of times you will start to weed out the unhealthy stuff. So instead of saying don't eat french fries, let's eat more salads, if we can do that, people are more focused on what kind of salad I'm going to have. What do I want on my salad? When am I going to have the salad? Not can't, can't, can't have this. I love that positive approach. Focus on your circle of influence. It's perfect. Yeah. So this has been such great information. What about, what resources are available to teammates at Atrium? We're all about connecting our teammates with what we are doing here at Atrium, or if we're doing something at Live Well, we want to make sure that our teammates know how they can get connected with resources to help them to better health. Yes, there um, are several options. One of the ones that we do as um, registered dietitians um, you don't have to be specialized in diabetes or have your certification, um, but pay, our teammates can have six hours a year um, if you have our insurance with a registered dietitian. Um, and you do not have to have diabetes. Um, I've had patients come to me who have no health history. They just want to learn how to eat better or how to cook better for their family or how to read food labels. So our insurance covers what's called medical nutrition therapy. So you get six hours a year with any red dietitian within our system, which I think is great. Um, so I advise definitely everyone to try to take advantage of that, whether it's for you or family, or if you're just trying to learn something new. And we have that information on our webpage and I can link it in our show notes as well. And that would be great. All we have to have is a referral from a primary care doctor, um, just somebody to be able to communicate with um, back and forth. And um, then we just call and set up the appointment. And right now we are doing virtual phone calls um, and virtual appointments, which has been very convenient for teammates. That's awesome. That's a great way to meet people where they are. And I'm sure after people, after our teammates are listening to this conversation, I think you're going to, you're going to put away a lot of those fears about having conversations about eating and managing or preventing their diabetes. So um, such a great benefit for the medical nutrition therapy, but this has been 
an amazing conversation. I think I love the positivity. I think this is going to be exactly the type of message we want to continue to provide. Uh, you're doing such important work for for our teammates, but also for our community. So we really we really appreciate you, Jennifer. Thank you, and thanks for having me. This was fun. Seth, that was the best interview. She is so positive about everything. I, you know, it really speaks to a lot of the positive energy about, you know, doing doing it a little bit more today, trying to make a, a better change today than you did yesterday, not trying to boil the ocean. I, I just really love the attitude, but I love the approach. And I think that's something that, that teammates and uh, their family members and everyone who's listening can really, really be touched by such, such a positive energy. I love it. And I love how she said, start with one small area and build out from there. I think a lot of times when we get a diagnosis or we're told we need to change our eating or start an exercise plan, it seems so big, right? It seems like I can never have again. But that's not what she said. She actually said she encourages people to eat and enjoy food. So just choose one area, one meal, one thing that you can start to make some of these changes. And it makes it more of a lifestyle than just a, a a quick fix. That's a very inspiring message. Let's move into some live well happenings. I only have two to share with you today. The first thing we want to talk about that's upcoming is maintain don't gain challenge. So this is a brand new challenge for our teammates. It's the last one of the year. So make sure you get engaged. It will start November 21st. All the information can be found on the Total Health Portal or on the Live Well website. The goal is that you maintain your weight throughout the holiday season. If you lose weight, great, but the goal is to not, typically people gain between seven and 10 pounds between this time and the end of the year. And so our goal is to try to avoid that extra weight gain through healthy habits. The other thing that's coming up, I'm so excited, is our Frosty 5K virtual race. This is so fun. So this is a First time we've done this for our teammates. Um, the race is going to be from December 5th through December 12th, so everyone can do it on their own time. It's a 5K walk run. 100 spots left for our registration. So make sure you go into the portal and get registered today. If the registration um, maxes out or if you miss the registration before the 20th, no worries. You can still participate in the race. Just log your with your completion in the Total Health Portal. But up until now, between now and the 20th, you can, we still have 100 spots left for that registration packet. So That's exciting. exciting. Very exciting, Jen. LiveWell's got you covered, teammates throughout the end of the year. Absolutely. Great. Great conversations today. Really glad that we had such awesome information come from, from Jennifer. And of course, that would be our, our guest, not you, Jennifer, Jen. Sometimes I get a little <laughs> confused here, but um, maybe let's recap it. What did we learn today? We learned so much stuff. We learned that nutrition and diabetes is individualized. But just because you have diabetes doesn't mean you have to cut out everything. Just make one small change at a time. We also learned that keeping a food journal or a food log can help with successful nutrition changes. This is one of my favorite things that Jennifer said, that the lentil or chickpea pasta has more fiber than whole wheat pasta. I cannot wait to try this and kind of sneak this in with my family. The last thing we learned is if you're on the med cost insurance, you get six free sessions with one of our atrium dietitians. I want to share with you something that um, one of our our teammates sent to me and one asked us to do a shout out and you know what may become a new section called you know partner shout out or teammate shout out. Michelle Pfeiffer sent information about how November is Epilepsy Awareness Month. Can I take a moment and just tell you what she sent? Yes, because we've been talking up to this point. You know, Live Well has been pushing the um, Diabetes Awareness Month for for good cause, but there's a lot of other things going on across the system. Tell us a little bit about it. Great. So the mission of the Epilepsy Foundation is to lead the fight to overcome the challenges of living with epilepsy and to accelerate therapies to stop seizures, find cures, and save lives. She said that they, if 
they wear purple in support and there's a hashtag this year that's hashtag NEAM 2020. The goal for the 2020 epilepsy awareness theme is small actions for big change. So just a little bit about epilepsy if you're not if you're not familiar, it's a neurologic disorder that can cause seizures or unusual sensations and behaviors. It is the fourth most common neurologic disorder and affects people of all ages. Epilepsy means the same as a seizure disorder and is characterized by unpredictable seizures that can cause other health problems. Epilepsy is a spectrum condition with a wide range of seizure types and control varying from person to person. If you want more information or if you want to participate in um, what the Epilepsy Foundation is doing, definitely check out the epilepsy.com website. This is a great, great organization, great cause to really bring awareness to. So I want to thank Michelle for bringing this to our attention. This is Thanks, great. Thanks, Michelle. So our next podcast will be airing on December 3rd as we go to wrap up this 2020 year. I'm excited. We'll have two more podcasts for the year and then we will move into 2021. And don't forget to visit the Live Well website for more info on managing stress, working with a Live Well health coach, and more information on connecting with a dietitian. Our resources are listed at the end of the show, and we'll add links to the programs discussed today in the comments on our streams channel. Looking for more things Live Well? Not following our streams channel yet? Search The Well on streams in Office 365 or find us on the Live Well website to access all our content. Thanks for listening to The Well today. Stay safe. And live well. <laughs>